See, I don't need no big axe. I don't know. You're the man. I forgot. It's the <laughs> mohawk. There's been a couple. Go uh, <laughs> with big, out big knots like, I in need them. The big axe. This is not gonna go. <laughs> Well, you say that, but then a couple go out in the middle of it. It's like, damn it. <laughs> well, that's embarrassing. This uh, has never happened to me yeah. before. <laughs> I swear it's the first time it's happened. I swear. This is the thing. I swear to God. <laughs> Fire building performance anxiety. <laughs> Stage fright. That's a whole nother uh, mental IQ clinic yeah. right there. There's a mental game to that, you know. <laughs> I guarantee. Yeah, so since we've chatted i've went down and trained the philadelphia phillies yeah, i knew you were doing that i didn't get a chance to ask you how yeah. that went it went really well yeah yeah did you blow some minds i did enlighten yeah. some peoples yeah it's been it's been really good i've been getting better at it's bryce young gonna ha- hit like 600 this year and a, yeah. a thousand home runs or what yeah, so it's, i just trained the pitching <laughs> or bryce crew, harper so. sorry I, bet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just trained the pitching crew so we'll right see on how the pitching goes yeah <clears throat> it was fascinating yeah like I didn't know what the problems were going to be, but now I do. Yeah? Yeah, it was good. Find a good solution for it? I did. Yeah? Yeah. It did, was... it, did some lights come on and all of a sudden things yes. got better? Yeah. Isn't that the coolest thing to watch? Yeah. So it, are we going? Is this, is this yeah. live? Yeah. Is this happening? Yeah. So there you go. <clears throat> this is happening. Yeah. <sighs> going into these the situations, like I don't know what problems I'm going to have to fix. Right. But I know I have the mental game for it. Mm-hmm. Right, so I'm not an expert. Like, I went and trained the Phillies. I'm not a major league pitcher. Right, mm-hmm. I went and trained a paving company the other day. Right, <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh, it's like sweet. I go into I go into these situations, and you have to figure out first of all, since I'm not an expert in in any of these things, I have to find out what the problems are. Like, what am I going to be facing? Get closer to you. There you go. How's that? Yep. That good. good. So, like, what am I going to be facing? So I went. You know, when I went down to the Phillies, I went to dinner with the uh, the pitching coach, the the big league pitching coach, mm-hmm. and the mental performance, the head mental performance coach. And from that, that's where I got like, what are the problems going to be that I'm going to be facing? Mm-hmm. And uh, so that was cool. And then, and we'll talk about that. But then I went and trained the paving company, right? Yeah. Like, I've never, I've never laid a piece of asphalt in my life, right? <laughs> so what I found in that is I was talking with the owner to get the problems, mm-hmm. but the owner doesn't have all the problems because people don't want to come to the owner with the problems. Right, right, right? exactly. It's harder so, to talk to. <clears throat> when I go in now, whatever situation I'm going into, if it's a corporate situation, I am going to go to the owners, but I'm going to go to the office managers. Gotcha. For the problems, right? Because they're the ones that are fielding all the stuff that's going on. Of course. So it was, it's fascinating to me that it's like I consider myself the master of the unknown obvious because mm-hmm. it's right there in front of their face, but they skip right over yeah, it. Yeah, you can't right? put it together. You just yeah. go beyond it. Yeah, the solution is right there. So, yeah. yeah, it was very interesting going down with the Phillies because I didn't realize how they were trying to fix problems. Like, because they didn't know about open and closed loop control systems. Mm. They don't know the where and the when for the mental game equation. Gotcha. So if you don't know that, you, you literally don't know where you can fix problems and where you can't. Right. So they were trying to fix stuff. Like, can you give me an example of what they were trying to do? <clears throat> yeah. So like on one specific thing, they've got a, a pitching lab where they like just dissect the movement of the pitcher down to the nth degree. It's all slow motion cameras, all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And they had one guy that was evidently when he was trying to throw a cutter, which I didn't know what a cutter was, but (laughs) it's it's a type of pitch. And he was uh, loosening his wrist when he was trying to release the ball, and it screws up where the ball comes out of the fingers. And it's just the pitch doesn't go where you need it to go. And they're trying to figure out how to fix that. And they told me that they're trying to get him to like, you know, cut the ball in half with his finger or flex his wrist at a certain point, but mm-hmm. it was all past the leg lift in the pitch. Okay. It's in the open loop portion of the pitch. Yeah. Got you. you can't fix anything there because your body can't gain the feedback that it needs. Yeah, it's so mm-hmm. fast, right? Right. It's so yeah. fast, it's very violent movement. Right. As these, you know, pitching, shooting a free throw, whatever. That's open loop. It's supposed to be fluid. You got to yeah. keep your conscious mind out 
of that portion of the movement. Swinging a golf club? Yeah. Yeah. You got to learn how Hitting to keep a pickleball forehand. Yeah, right. You know you what gotta I'm saying? Keep, you got to keep it out. So it's <laughs> it's the solution for all these things. But if you don't know open and closed loop control systems and like the real practical application of those, mm -hmm. like you can understand the clinical version of it, but sure. you got to understand the practical application like we do in shooting. Mm -hmm. And but it's just completely the opposite. Right. So we got them to fix the problem before the leg lift in the closed loop portion of the pitch. Like you just put tension in your wrist before you go lifting your leg. Mm -hmm. And that, that will transfer. Like if you put, we know from shooting that if right. you put your conscious mind into back tension, you, then you put that on a subconscious maintenance program, you've got about five seconds of duration yes. before it has to be consciously recued. Yeah. So as long as they flex their wrist and then pitch within that five seconds, it'll stay. It'll stay, right? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. It's just fascinating stuff to learn about all these movements and, and what they know and what they don't know and, you know, figuring out the mental game for them. And, and are they speaking the same language? Because right. it was funny because in professional archery, there's like no coaches. There's, there's, well, sure there is. Well, sure, yes. But when you go to, <laughs> like most professional archers right. don't have a coach, right? No, they do not. But most professional Baseball players, and I mean, there's coaches on top of coaches oh, yeah. on top of coaches. Yeah. But are they speaking the right language? Right. Like you would see an, an archery coach that's in the archery, that's in the, the coach's box. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, when both the shooters get done, you can actually do some coaching. What mm -hmm. are you saying to your archer? Well, what I found out in the, in the baseball world is they're not speaking the same language because they don't know how they do what they do. Gotcha. So... My first question, I've got like 40 MLB pitchers in there, and I've got at least 10 pitching coaches in this room. And from the problems that I figured out the night before when, when I was at dinner, I'm like, this is my first question. What's a mound visit sound like for you? Right? Sure. So I'm like, who are my coaches? And then, you know, a few of them raise their hand. I'm like, what's a mound visit sound like for you? And they go, um... It was just like silence, right? Because <laughs> the mountain visits for the coach is a big deal. They pride themselves in being able to fix a problem, right? right? But if you're not speaking the same language... It won't matter. Because the, the pitcher doesn't know how they do what they do because they've never blueprinted their shot or blueprinted their pitch. Right. The coaches don't know how they do what they do because the pitcher's never blueprinted it and the coach has never asked the right question. Right. So now I'm like, what's a mound visit sound like? And they're like, well, I was one coach... Pipes up and says, I like to ask the pitcher how they're feeling. I said, okay. <laughs> how are you feeling? And I, I looked at the players and I'm like, and what do you guys tell them? And one of the players was like, well, sometimes we tell them we're feeling good. Sometimes we tell them we're feeling bad. I'm like, that's a worthless conversation, fellas. <laughs> right? It doesn't fix the problem. No. It's all thoughts. You're, right. you're asking somebody their thoughts. Yeah. And they, have no, they have no control over that. Thoughts aren't thinking, thoughts aren't right? aren't thinking. So you have no control over that. And then they're not speaking the same way. They're not solving a problem. Because obviously, right. if there was a mound visit, there's probably a problem that happened. You either hit a, hit a battery, throwing too many balls, whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so now, once we figured out what the blueprint is, what does this pitcher say? At what moment, right? What mental game are they playing? And then once they have that and they blueprint it, they relay that information to their coach. Now the coach knows what this pitcher says at what portion of their pitch, right? So they're both now speaking the same language. And so now when there is a mound visit, the coach can say, hey, man, what are you saying? And when are you saying it? Right. Oh, man, I forgot to say my word. Right? right, And so now you're like, okay, now we can instantly fix the problem because you've blueprinted it. You blueprint your good day and you blueprint your bad day, and you'll find that you're probably not talking on the bad days. Sure. And so now you know you don't have these good days and bad days because people are actually afraid to think when they're having a good day. Right. right, like man, when I'm when I'm in the flow, I just want to stay in the flow and just do my thing. I'm like, don't talk to him. I'm like, that's awesome <laughs> if you know how you do what you do. Yeah. If you know why it's a good day. Yeah. What powerful information is that? I mean, it's it's beautiful to know that yeah. how you're having a good day, and just realize that and just keep on keeping on if you're having a good day. But when it's a bad day, that's when you got to dive deep. That's when you got to get in the toolbox and go, oh yeah. I'm supposed to say this at this moment. That'll put my conscious mind in this place, right? So, but knowing 
when to speak and what to speak yeah. is a big deal. Because if you say the wrong thing at the wrong time, if you put your conscious mind into the portion of the pitch that's past the leg lift, you kill the totality of the movement. It's right. not going to go in the catcher's mitt in the strike zone. So pretty cool. We've devised all kinds of new tests and stuff for them to do. And that's wild. Yeah, pretty awesome stuff. How yeah. was working with that group of people? Like A lot of people don't get to coach um, or be around professional athletes. Were they coachable? Were yeah. they tough to work with? Like, what was that? No, they're very accepting because they're all trying to they're all trying to get to the next little notch, right? What's the next advantage? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And having a blueprint for the mental game is a massive advantage. It is such a secret weapon for them to have that. And uh, just understanding, like I was just saying, how do you do what you do? Then you stop having these big fluctuations in your performance. Yeah. Your lows that, get closer to your highs. Yeah. yeah. It's really cool. They were very accepting of it. And I was asking some very thought-provoking questions. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you have a tendency of doing yeah, that. Yeah, like, <laughs> what's the definition of the mental game? How do you do what you do? That always gets uh, silent. That always gets some silence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty fun. And yeah, nobody wants to answer the question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Josh, we jumped the gun, hopped into it a little bit. Why don't you intro, <clears throat> intro Joel and just talk about... Huh? The man who needs no introduction? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody knows who Joel Turner is. All yeah. right, we'll tell him about him a little this bit. Is, this is Joel Turner. He is the expert of... The mental game. It is this. Like, if, and it doesn't matter what sport or thing we're talking about. He has mastered how to mentally work through something yeah. on almost whatever it is. I mean, that's a fair statement, is it not? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, if you happen to be randomly watching this podcast and it's not archery related, he might be able to fix your problems and you might <laughs> want to give him a call. How and, did um, how'd you guys become friends? Um, well, when did I first meet you? You, you came to uh, the, I think the second elk shape yeah, camp it was here. Elk shape camp, yeah. Yeah, that's when we first met. Uh huh. Yeah, and you had a pair of uh, prototype uh, Sitka archery pants. Oh yeah. That nobody had like, <laughs> what the heck kind of pants are those? I remember that, that <laughs> yeah, was like a right. year or two before they came out or something right, like that. Right. Yeah, and I I remember listening to listening to him talk. It. It's always very thought provoking. It it there's there's something with the way that you present and something the way you communicate forces people's brains to think in ways they haven't thought. And it's as much as anybody may try to duplicate that, I've never heard it duplicated well and I've never heard a presentation nearly as good. Neither had I ever heard the term uh, pedo elk before. <laughs> <laughs> that's a totally a Dan statement. <laughs> that, that's a Dan. I call it instinctive elk calling. He calls it pedo elk calling. Like for the the short for pedophile. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is hilarious. But when you think about it, yeah, there's no pedo- pedophiles don't count in the woods. <laughs> it's just, they are what they are. Right. Oh, it's not a wrong. But but yeah, just I, I just I still every time I. Every time I listen to you talk, and I've heard you talk a lot, <laughs> yeah. I still I tend to talk ta- I take something away from it. Good, literally every time. So even if you've, even if you've been through your stuff, it's so valuable to keep listening because you just constantly pick up something new out of it. It's it's amazing yeah. to me. And I uh, there's, I've I've heard lots of different people talk and lots of different experts that are surround this field that I really enjoy. Right, mm-hmm. I will always listen to you talk. Appreciate Even it. if I hear the same thing, I'm still <laughs> listening because I've I've always picked up something yeah. that's so much that just makes your yeah. brain do something. And it's an evolution for me as well. I mean, the more I teach this stuff, and I've been doing it since 2015 now, mm-hmm. it's just constantly evolving into simpler and simpler forms, mm-hmm. uh, deeper but simpler. Mm-hmm. And uh, and now with the mind IQ stuff, now we're able to apply it everywhere. So, yeah. so far, I know that's a, a new, a new, relatively new venture for you. How mm-hmm. how much of your workload has shifted to things that aren't instructing people on shooting? <clears throat> it's becoming more more mind IQ than shot IQ. I would expect. Yeah, just because yeah. once it, but the thing is, is I don't have any cred in that world, and that's what I'm building now by talking to the top level peoples in me- people in mental performance and explaining things to them and making them think and going, huh, that's gold. Because what, what I do and what I what I'm, have a specialty for is finding the depth of the solution. Yeah. Like I know the practical 
the practical end of things. I, I go and I speak with the clinical folks. They give me information down to the brain chemical level, even further than that. Mm-hmm. And uh, like when I spoke with Huberman the other day, it was fascinating to listen to him talk. A simple question I would ask him, like, what's the difference between open and closed loop control systems for you? And mm-hmm. man, it went down to neuron level. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> holy smokes, right? <laughs> and uh, But then you take that <clears throat> and you make it into simple terms so that everybody can understand it and put it in a practical application like, oh, that's why this happens or whatever. So mm-hmm. that's what's super fun. And, and so now I'm getting more into movement problems for professional sports teams and golfers and drag racers and Formula One racers and basketball and <laughs> all this stuff. Wow. Anything that requires movement, any, any time a mental game must be played and – what we're finding out now, whether you realize it or not, everything in life is a mental game. It is. But people don't they don't see it that way, and they haven't mm-hmm. defined it. And that's what we do is we define it for you. We take your problem. We plug it into the mental game equation. We understand that thoughts aren't thinking. Mental game equation, open and closed loop control systems. Maybe it's a movement problem. Maybe it's a cerebral problem. Mm-hmm. And that's where we're really starting to dive into how do we, how do we plug a cerebral problem, like an anxiety attack or whatever, into... The mental game equation. And <clears throat> that's somewhat tricky because the where, where do you put your conscious mind is is different for everybody. Yeah. So, but what's cool is what we're finding is those that have archery in their background, I would go a step further. Those that have controlled archery in their background mm-hmm. have a massive tool to fix anxiety problems yeah. because Every archery shot is an anxiety attack. It's hmm. just like, yeah. you know, I mean, people have debilitating panic attacks where the volume of their thoughts has reached a level that's deafening and they can't seem to get the volume of their thinking beyond that. So when it's, when it's a cerebral problem, what's the first thing we need to do? The first mental game, breathing, that's right? right? Getting them to control their breathing so that their heart rate comes down so that they have access to their thinking, their prefrontal cortex. And once you get them to do that, now what's the second mental game for an anxiety attack, right? Where do you need them to put their conscious mind? Is it in, basically what we're finding out now is you got to get them into the present. Mm -hmm. And getting somebody to just step back, right? They're spinning out of control and getting them to just step back one little step, right? Like, I'm not dying right now. Right. Right. What's next? Okay. I actually have a roof over my head, right? (laughs) Nobody's trying to shoot at me right now, right? So just getting them to step back and zoom out from the problem just a little bit and gain some more perspective and get back in the present. And that's what we're working on now. And it's just fascinating stuff. But in an archery shot, you are literally overriding both your limbic system that's going, man, that's, that's really far. Right? <laughs> sure. Oh my God, it's a six by six bull elk, right? That's your limbic system giving you thoughts, which you have no control over, right? right? And then a lot of people, I mean, people black out in shots at big game animals all the time. Sure. That's you in a panic attack going into the fetal position, literally. Yeah. Mentally going into the fetal position and just giving it to your subconscious. Yep. Get me out of this. It's too much. I can't handle it's, it. Yep. Subconscious yep. take over. What's a peep sight? I don't know how far. I don't care. Ha! <laughs> right? Yeah. And you just give it the business. Which, which pin was it <laughs> right? again? So, uh, I don't remember. When Engage you have, the rattlesnake. But yeah. when you have a controlled archery shot mm-hmm. and you know exactly how it's going to go, that is very powerful information because you have the same thoughts. Right. Oh, my God, it's a giant bull. I need to draw back and aim, right? Yep. Thoughts, giant bull, thinking, I need to draw back and aim, right? Address the trigger. Here I go. Start talking yourself through the pressure increase. And you override not only your limbic system, but your central nervous system. Those two are kind of combined. But you literally get to overcome this miniature anxiety attack. And you come out of that very proud of what you did. Right. Like having shot control is everything and we're finding out now it's really everything when you can control an archery shot that's the top that's the top of the top in concentration practice sure and then you control that 
you know, sometimes 200 times a day, mm -hmm. right? And then when it comes to these other problems, it just gets easier and easier. Your mental game is easy. Where yeah. do I need to put it? When do I need to put it there? How do I put it there, right? Yeah. Simple stuff. Yeah. Yeah, good times. It's amazing. It really is. Yeah. Even I'm trying to remember what you had. There was one thought you said in there that I hadn't heard before that made my brain go, oh, yeah. Like, it's a miniature it's anxiety attack. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's, so, that's incredible. <clears throat> like I was talking to somebody the other day that was having debilitating panic attacks. Mm -hmm. And I asked, and I've trained her in shooting, and I asked her, I said, when was the last time you shot your bow? And she said, I haven't touched my bow since I started having these panic attacks. I'm like, you need to go shoot your bow. Because when I first trained her, she was locked feet off of a target. Hmm. She would hold super low, like feet low. Mm -hmm. And then she would jump to the target and punch the trigger, right? It's very common. I used to do the same thing. But like I was feet off of a target. Most people are just holding six o'clock on the gold and right. they think the world's coming to an end. That's yeah. nothing <laughs> compared to holding five feet off a target like I used to when Can't I was a kid. Can't even get remotely close Can't even get remotely close. <laughs> so I asked her that question. I'm like... When was the last time you shot your bow? She goes, I haven't, I haven't touched my bow. I said, think about what you do when you control an archery shot, because now she has total control of her shot. And I said, you got to go shoot your bow. And you shoot your bow, and I don't want you to just shoot your bow. I want you to shoot with massive control, like the most control you've ever had. Like put the determination in there. I want you to be so proud of your shot that you just want to send me the video of that every single time. Like look at this, Turner. This is amazing. And when you do that, these debilitating panic attacks, you'll start to gain some perspective mm -hmm. on this. Like, and that's what's lacking in, in a lot of people. Like I tell people all the time, you need to go get shot at. Don't get hit, right? <laughs> yeah, don't get, I don't yeah. recommend you get hit, right? But go get shot at, right? Yeah. Now, it's not something that you're going to do, obviously, but it changes your entire world. I'm yeah, sure. you're just saying there's worse things in life yeah. that could happen, right? When you, I mean, you get shot at, your life flashes in front of your eyes, whatever that may be for you, and then all the other problems, not even close. Right. Not even close. So just maybe it's just you saying, I'm not going to die, right? Get a hold yeah. of your breathing. I ain't going to die. Not today, right? Mm -hmm. And then you start working. You start stepping back from the spin out. Just step back a little bit at a time, right? Play that mental game. And then things will come into perspective. You can actually move again. You're like, okay, what's going on right now? And then you just start, what's the real problem? You plug that into the mental game equation. Then whatever is next, just keep plugging it into the equation. And you get good at it, and you blueprint how you did it. Then when it comes upon, upon you again, eh, even easier. You know how you got out of it, right? right. It's just like an archery shot <laughs> over and over and over again. But people don't blueprint how they do what they do. It's the missing link, right? If yeah. you knew exactly how, like, when I was a little kid starting to shoot a bow, if I'd have known how to blueprint things, oh, man, if I just would have understood the concept of thoughts aren't thinking, man, we can be so much more effective. Think, think of where you'd be now, right? Oh, <laughs> But everything yeah. happens for a reason, right? Sure. If you didn't have that problem, you probably wouldn't be where sure. you are. Well, I never would have had the perspective if I wasn't a cop. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Hadn't yeah. been shot at numerous yeah. times. I'd have never had the perspective I had now. And if you never had target panic, you probably never would have went down the rabbit hole of fixing mm. it. No. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, here you are. The just move, yeah, then we wouldn't have my, a mental game genius. Yeah, my <laughs> my life story is just like one mental game after another, and I conquered it by accident. Yeah. Right, and then it's not by accident anymore. No. Yeah. <laughs> now it's total control. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. Well, pretty heavy on uh, Josh was how Vegas went for him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that was pretty much, we don't typically don't whiteboard too many topics, but that was something important we wanted to talk about today. So do you want to give like a little highlight of how Vegas went for you? Sure. And can, yeah, no, that, that's what. We're really, basically going to do an open therapy session with Joel. Yeah, that's what, Josh. That's, that's, what prom, that's what prompted this originally because I was okay. like, because he, I made it, I went to Vegas, um, shot decent for myself the first day. You know, mm -hmm. it wasn't, wasn't a 300, but. I hadn't been shooting, but for two weeks before I went down, I hadn't shot in like three months since. And that. do you, it just in your practice in the history of of you, have you shot three hundreds before? Yes. Okay. Yes, but it's been a long time since I've shot it. It's been door. a long time. Traditionally, in the winter, I just I didn't have time. I was always there's a if you follow our industry, mm -hmm. products come out between October and 
February. Indoor season. Uh, indoor season. Right? <laughs> indoor so season. my my workload's really heavy then. Mm-hmm. It's, and now that I do reviews and things like that, it's even mm-hmm. worse because you try to do those as quick as you can. And so my my plate gets super, super full mm-hmm. that time of year. So to try to say, oh, yeah, I'm going to practice three, four days a week and shoot league every week, that's not going to happen. I don't yeah. have that much time. Um, and I ended up putting it off a little too long, waited too long to pull a bow out of inventory for myself. Mm-hmm. So I ended up waiting till like 10 days, 12 days before I went to bolt my bow together. Okay. They were taking bets. <laughs> That's better than average for him, Joel. They were taking <laughs> bets. <laughs> okay. They were taking bets at the shop of what day it was going to be that Josh actually put his bow together and started shooting. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm trying to remember who won, but there was like 12 of them in on uh. it. They were all betting money on it. Uh, but in any event, I, I didn't have a ton of practice, but every every time I shot 30 arrows out of that bow, I shot a higher score. Uh-huh. And uh, figured out things, got got it tuned relatively good. Got to where I felt comfortable with it, and I knew mm-hmm. that I just didn't want to look like an idiot. I'm not trying to win anything at this point in my life. I could really care less about that. I go to events and things of that nature to meet people, help people, work with people, try to mm-hmm. better the sport. You know, great. If I if I really wanted to be super competitive, I could, but I also didn't want to look like an idiot. Mm-hmm. But I experienced something I'd never experienced in my life because I used to shoot competitively mm-hmm. and never really had that pro- the, mm-hmm. the problems that occurred to me. Mm-hmm. Shoot the first day, and I, I can't remember the exact scores anymore the first day. It was in the high 90s, mid 90s. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was 96 or something. Okay. Anyway, I don't remember exactly, so don't mm-hmm. quote me on it. But um, And felt okay. And, and I figured mentally that was going to be a day I was most nervous because I hadn't done this in a really long time. Mm-hmm. And I shot two league nights. Before I went, and that was it. Okay. <laughs> and and just shot some thirty arrow rounds on my mm-hmm. own time. And I shot a, I shot a ninety eight or a ninety nine, Saturday before I left. Mm-hmm. It, it wasn't during league, but you know, and it wasn't. Um, no part of it was straining at all or anything like that. So I I felt good. I felt like all right, keep doing this for a month and you should be fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, I intended to come home and keep shooting, but I've gotten even mm-hmm. crazier and didn't do that. Yeah. But regardless, day two rolls around. <clears throat> I told myself something very foolish, and normally I don't ever tell myself things like this, and I don't know for the life of me why I did, but I said, mm-hmm. well, there's no, at least you can't possibly shoot worse than you did the first time you shot the bow, which I shot a 292 the first time I shot the bow. Mm-hmm. My sight scope was running into the, the side of my <laughs> yeah, riser because right. I was shooting that Matthews, and I bridge uh, locked it and ran out of movement uh, mm-hmm. and kept clicking it, and it wasn't moving, and it was scope pitching mm-hmm. the scope head, and I shot... In that situation, I shot 292. I went, hey, you won't shoot worse than that. Right. And I shot worse than that <laughs> the next day. Mm-hmm. And the first day, my pin would move like it normally does, right? And the majority of the shots were would go off somewhere in the middle of the mm-hmm. movement. Um, and then the second day, every shot broke at the extreme movement of the apex of the shot. Mm-hmm. And I'd never experienced that in my life. Mm-hmm. And really mad at myself probably should have went and shot my bow and played with my weight and Mm -hmm. didn't. I was just like, just, you did that to yourself because you told yourself this phrase that I couldn't possibly shoot worse than that, Mm -hmm. right? And then I did it again that (laughs) night right before I went to bed. I was like, well, hey, at least you know that's the worst you could possibly (laughs) shoot, right? right? (laughs) It's over with now. You don't have to be stressed about it because traditionally, like when you're trying to shoot a 300 when you haven't before, mm-hmm. as soon as you drew, drop a point, everything's fine, and you're mm-hmm. yeah. pounding. And you just it's, smoke an X's. Yeah. You're just smoking X's. Yeah. Consequently, both days, as soon as I got below that number, it all went in the middle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, what the hell? And I shot worse the, th- the next day, and as soon as I got past the round where I shot worse, they all mm-hmm. went in the middle. Mm-hmm. It's like, I, I was flabbergasted. Because I've never experienced that, and I'm I've been shooting since I was like five, and yeah. I'm 44, and I've never experienced that. <laughs> and I was embarrassed uh, for myself, uh-huh. very embarrassed, because it just seemed idiotic that I allowed myself into that situation. Because I knew I shouldn't have ever said those words to myself. Okay, and I don't know what for the life of me now why I did, but I waited like five days <laughs> until after Vegas, so okay. then I texted you. I said, "Hey." When you have time, I kind of need to talk to you. <laughs> and never before, every time I've listened to you talk, I've loved every minute of it. It's been so so refreshing, rewarding, and enjoyable and uh-huh. great growth. But I never really felt like I needed it. <laughs> I'll be honest. <laughs> I, it always made me think new things. Uh-huh. And I went, "That's that, I do that. Yeah. I didn't, didn't yeah. know it, you know? Yeah. Because you're explaining processes that you're, uh-huh. if, you, if you're doing this well, you're probably doing them. You just don't realize that's what you're doing yeah. or you've never focused on it in the right uh-huh. way. Maybe that's the best way to put yeah. it. But 
So I never really felt like I needed your help, but I called him. I'm like, "All right, man, <laughs> what the hell happened here? Yeah, I don't, I've never experienced anything like this, and uh, you, you, you talked me through it, and and you, uh, you're a very large advocate for um, single digit manipulation or mm -hmm. moving your finger, not progressively pulling rotational hard. Is that right. fair thing to say? If, okay. Well, just an accuracy standpoint, single digit manipulation. The Minimal amount of input is going to be the most accurate. Sure. Now, can you control that? That's the question. Yeah. Right. So, well, and through the whole thing, which you, had, I want to say we talked about it a little bit. We say, did you ever freak out or something? And I didn't. Mm -hmm. I was frustrated that it kept doing what it was doing, mm -hmm. but I mentally never, like, I never made a shot go off. I never, like, jerked nothing. It's mm -hmm. just my brain still stayed calm. It was mm -hmm. just upset, but it was still calm. Mm hmm. And I'm now convinced that I'm going to shoot my bow that way. So, that. so you shot a surprise break every time. Yes, hundred okay. percent. So that's the main. That's the biggest problem, right? So if you shoot a surprise break every time, you've eliminated pre ignition movements from your shot. That's good, right? That's what we're all striving for. No pre ignition movements linked to the trigger motor program. Yeah. That's the benefit, right? That's good, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's the main thing. To but, dumb that down a little bit, you didn't react to the arrow going you didn't off before just, it went off, like flinching. You didn't go open loop on the trigger. You didn't Got it? Inch, yeah, whatever. Okay. So that's the main thing. But what you didn't know, because it's been so long since you've shot, and that was your first time shooting Vegas, was it not? Oh, I've never been to Vegas. Okay, so you've yeah. never been to Vegas. So if you've never been to Vegas, you don't know where the nerves hit you. Yeah. Okay, like I'm going to get through my shot no matter what. You're going to get through your shot no matter what, meaning you're going to go closed loop on the trigger. That's a constant, mm -hmm. right? So once you know that, once there's no mystery, like Josh Jones is not going to punch a trigger. Bodie Turner is not going to punch a trigger. Joel Turner is not going to punch a trigger. That is a known, that is a fundamental truth, Right. okay? Now you got to start to figure out where is the stress hitting me in my shot because it's not in the trigger movement which is good mm -hmm. that's where it hits most folks that don't have control or shot but you got to figure out where it hits you if it hits you in your legs your legs will be shaking like what in the hell is going on right now like as soon as the announcer said this is your first scoring end i used to my legs would start shaking right my mm -hmm. practice ends were money Holy smokes, I was visibly shaking. As soon as they say it's your first scoring end, I used to visibly shake. I don't do that anymore. But what I noticed in Lancaster this year was I was putting my two fingers on the front of my bow and squeezing it like I was trying to make it bleed, okay? <laughs> I didn't realize that. Yeah. That's where the nerves hit me at Lancaster. So it's just a self-awareness thing, right? So once I figured that out, in my elimination rounds, I put it in as a conscious step. I would draw my bow back, and I would consciously take my fingers off the front of my bow. That eliminated all that, the torque that I was creating, because what I was seeing in the target was lefts and rights. Mm -hmm. So I know that that's probably a torque issue up in my, up yep. in my bow hand. Uh, previously at Rushmore Rumble, it was hitting me in my release hand. It's like I couldn't let go properly. Mm -hmm. So it was just, you know, I was shooting with my fingers and it would just felt chunky, like, ping, ping. I'm like, oh, that sucked, <laughs> right? And so that was at the Rushmore Rumble. So that was new for me. I didn't have the shakes at the Rushmore Rumble. I didn't have the shakes at Lancaster. I didn't have the shakes at Vegas. So maybe Joel Turner is over the shakes now. That's cool. But it always hits you somewhere. And that's what you got to get good at recognizing where is it hitting you right now? And so on your first scoring end, it's gonna hit it's gonna be there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Now, hopefully you've refined your shot enough to where you're very aware of what tensions are in what directions. Mm -hmm. And you're able to get the first end in the X. Because once you get the first end in the X, then you know, okay, it's hitting me somewhere, but it's not affecting my accuracy. Gotcha. When you see an accuracy change, that's when you got to get. That's when you got to get smart in a hurry. Where is it hitting me? And I was taking me at Lancaster this year and at Rushmore. It was taking me too long to figure, to out, figure out the problem. Out. It was taking me till after my qualification round. Now, luckily, I had a next day where I was able to put those new skills into an elimination round. Mm -hmm. 
At Vegas, your first day is figuring out where it hits you. And you shot okay your first day, but not quite to your potential. Yeah. Right? So it was hitting you, but you didn't know where. And that's where you got to analyze the target. Am I getting lefts and rights? Am I getting ups and downs? Mm-hmm. Where is it Where is it happening or what's happening on the target? That will that'll give you some inclination of where it's hitting you. Like when I got to Vegas, shot my first day, uh, decent, not great. Lots of ups and downs. I mean, my line was money. So I knew that this wasn't an issue. Mm-hmm. My torque was an issue, but I didn't realize that it was now hitting me in healing the bow. Mm. So I'd get like a high six. I'm like, oh, man, that shot broke perfectly. Mm-hmm. Why did it go a high six? Then I'd get a low eight. It broke perfectly. I know I was aiming in the right spot. Yeah. Everything was good. Why is it a low eight? So I went to the practice range, and one of my buddies, because a lot of people, like if they watch me shoot, they watch my target. They don't watch me. Yeah. So I don't like the same thing with you. When yeah. you shoot, they're not watching you. They're watching your target. Yeah. They want to see how good Josh Jones is. They want to see how good Joel Turner is. They don't watch us. Yeah. So we don't get very much critique in our shot. And right? that's where a good coach could be helpful in that situation, yeah, it's, right? It's very help valuable sort through for, those thoughts. For somebody to actually that knows mm-hmm. a controlled archery shot, knows the biomechanics of a shot, to actually watch you. So I told this to uh, Robbie Weisinger, who's a great barebow shooter. Uh, he said, <laughs> I'm walking to the range, and he comes out and says, Turner, I need some help. I'm like, let's go. We're going to the range, right? So while we were there, I was walking him through some shot control stuff that he was dealing with, and then uh, we left or split ways or whatever, and then later that later that day, we're both on the practice range again, and he says, Turner, check this out. He goes, I know what your up and down problem. I'm like, what do you got? And he goes, just heal your bow. Like, heal the crap out of it. So I just I just put a bunch of heel into it. And it shot a high six. He says, okay, now put your grip high up, throat, in, the, up yeah. in the throat of it. Shot a low six. I'm like, I had no idea that it was that big. Because I had just changed to a low wrist grip. Mm-hmm. So I've never really had to think about my grip, how much heel or how much throat I have into it. Yeah. What a huge difference. So, you know, last day I'm shooting just better and better and better. But You'd think we'd have this stuff figured out by now, right? <laughs> you assume. But you can't, yeah. you will never know where the stress hits you if you never experienced Vegas yeah. or Lancaster. So now you know. So now you got to really dissect it and go, okay, this is where it was hitting me. Now you were having thoughts, right? The elevation of the volume of your thoughts was increasing. Yeah. Yeah. But you still shot surprise break shots. So mm-hmm. that wasn't affecting you. Yeah. So maybe you, Maybe you were thinking that it was, but thoughts aren't thinking. Thoughts are what you hear. Thinking is what you say. It's got to be your voice. Got to be the loudest one in the room. Yeah. Thinking or thoughts have no instruction. Thoughts have yeah. no strategy. Yeah. You know all that stuff. Yeah. You said a phrase to yourself, which just increased the volume of your thoughts. Yeah. But it didn't necessarily affect your release movement. Yeah. That's the key. Don't let it go into your release movement. It's going to go somewhere else. Like, if you were able to tell me that your pin, it's breaking at the edge of the extremes of the pin range mm-hmm. of movement, I would say either your bow is too heavy, your draw length is too long, or your holding weight's too low. Gotcha. So you can just incremental changes, shorten your draw length by a 16th of an inch, yeah. like a twist in your string. Yeah. Right? I was Lip, playing with that before I left, too. Yeah, and you're, yeah, and you're the master of that stuff, of, the, of yeah. this tuning stuff. But yeah. that gets that pin speed up. Because if you're telling me it broke at the extreme range, you shouldn't be able to tell me that. Yeah, It should be moving so fast in the gold, mm-hmm. just, just buzzing around, that it breaks where it breaks. Yeah, And because the rate of return to center is so fast, it's going to be in the middle every time, no right. matter where it breaks in the gold. Yeah. So, But again, your body is physiologically changed on that line in ways that you don't know until you experience it. Sure. So now that you've experienced it, now you can really dissect it and then build a more bulletproof shot to where if tension comes in, cool. So many people that have that get the shakes when they're on the line, I mean, there's hundred thousands of archers on the line practicing, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, the practice halls are full of people. Oh, God, yeah. And they're all practicing 
their perfect shot. They're practicing for a non-reality event. Right. Yeah. I'm like, why are you? And people are like, man, Turner, what do, we, what do I do, man? When I get up there and they say it's for score, I just start shaking like crazy. I'm like, well, welcome to being a human being. Yeah. Right? And when was the last time you shot on one foot? <laughs> right? When was the last time you yeah. shot on one foot? On the practice line at Vegas with all the people standing around you wondering what in the hell is Turner doing right now? He's shooting so, on one foot. What you're describing is building a bridge between your practice and your play, which I, I would I talk frequently with golfers about, but it's like it's easy for things to be easy on the range, mm-hmm. right? But then when it matters, it matters a lot. So you need this like bridge or this these steps that you slowly go up to get you closer and closer to playing. And um you had to have seen eventually it you get and you kind of do it in layers, right? Like right. okay, you can shoot off of you can make it a little more uncomfortable because Joel's standing four inches from your face, right? But then try standing on one foot while Joel's four inches from your face. And you can kind of do it in layers where you build that confidence by experiencing success in a situation that's less than perfect. And not and, and understanding what the goal of that drill is, because when I stand on one foot, it almost perfectly replicates the amount of shake I have on the first scoring end. Interesting. Hmm. That's it cool. almost perfectly replicates that. So when I see that, it's like an old friend, right? It's like, <laughs> oh, yeah, I see you. I've seen you before. I don't care. I'm still going to work through my shot. But people, yeah. when that pin starts moving all out into the red, maybe even out into the blue, they lose their mind because the volume of their thoughts increases. Like, oh, my gosh, how am I ever going to hit this thing when my pin's in the blue? But you have to have seen that before because what you'll notice when you shoot on one foot if you break a surprise break shot with it, right? It's not the goal of that drill is not to hit the X. The goal of that drill is to keep your mind where it needs to be because it's obviously going to go into the fact that your aim is now huge. You're like, "Oh my gosh, my aim is huge. Wait, that's not where I need to be. I need to be back here." "Oh my gosh, I'm about to fall over." So you put a foot down because your conscious mind goes to balance. So you put your foot down, you pick it back up, and you put your mind back in your release movement. So that you get amazing reps when you practice harder than your play, right? You got to make your practice harder than your play. And if you understand where the stress hits you, then shoot your bow and tune your bow to where it can handle some healing. It can handle some throat in the, in mm-hmm. the grip, right? Mm-hmm. If that's where it hits you, torque tune it so it can handle a little extra torque this way or that. Sure. Right, get your stabilization system so it can handle a big pin movement. But the pin movement so fast, it's always coming back to the center. Because when people hit the X when they stand on one foot, even with that huge aim, it's like a light bulb going off. It's like, huh? It still went in the middle. I did this drill with Levi Morgan. He's yeah. like, I can't believe it still went in the middle. I'm like, yeah, you have no control over your aim. You just made it bigger to give yourself better reps and bringing your mind back. So understanding shooting these tournaments is of utmost importance so that you understand where the stress hits you. Then you can tune your bow accordingly. You can tune your mind accordingly because you really can't tune your body because the physiological changes you have no control of. You can't control how much adrenaline is dumped into your system. Right. Yeah, that's very interesting. I just experienced what you're describing on a on a small scale the other day. I was shooting uh, two bows side by side. One of them had a lens, the other didn't. Mm. And with the lens, you see a lot more of the movement. Mm-hmm. And then you go back to the other pin, and it's like, holy smokes! There's so much confidence because that pin's just buried. Right. You know. Um, you shoot on one foot, it makes shooting on two <laughs> yeah. feet so much yeah. easier. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Now, now hearing that, Josh, though, um, reflecting on those questions, what do you? Does, does that give you any insight to what you thought was going on? Yeah, for sure. Uh, my, my bow uh, was not set right, for sure. I know that now. Um, because as soon as I started moving my bars around, too, and mm-hmm. shifting I remember some saying weight that, around, yeah. it made a big difference in what yeah. my picture was doing. And I was really hesitant to touch that. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. I don't want to touch it because it's going to change my impact. And on the third day, I, I just I chalked up day two to, you just lost your brain. Mm-hmm. You're going to be fine. You're mm-hmm. mentally strong. This is not going to be an issue. 
And then day three, start scoring, and it looks just like it did on day two. I think I made it into the fourth round. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't care if I miss the whole target on the next round. I'm moving this crap around. Absolutely. And it helped a lot. And, that's and I'm, I dropped like four points getting it back into where it was hitting where – I mean, it was hitting consistently mm -hmm. now, and now it's get it back into the middle of the target where you're pointing where it's going. And that that's made a big difference. Bodhi is super good at that. So – Bodie's been in so many high stress shoot offs. He knows what happens to his body and he knows how to move things on his bow according to his body situation that day. Like he can take a bow and go, he'll shoot a 30x game with it. He's like, this bow's good, but it won't win Vegas. <laughs> yeah. It won't win Lancaster <laughs> because he knows what'll happen to the hold. Yeah. Because he'll replicate it somehow, whether he's standing on one foot or whatever he does, because he knows exactly what happens to his body. So he's like, nah, this bow, this riser's got too much deflex in it. The pin movement's too slow, right? He can shoot a 30x yeah. game with just about anything you hand him, but will it win Lancaster, right, when it comes down to 12 rings? Will it win Vegas when it comes down to the shoot-off? So he's very good at that, at adjusting the bow to his body condition for that day because it's different every single day which is kind of scary because Bodie's young <laughs> right <laughs> and but he's I mean, only going to get better yeah. at it yeah yeah, yeah. Um, wow. now Josh said hey at least I'm not going to do this and that's what he did w would you have a word for that phenomenon because in golf it would I would this, other it would go, than other than dipshit it would, <laughs> <laughs> but in golf it would that? go like this it would be like okay there's water next to the green yep I don't want to hit it in the water the ball goes in the water sure Right, and maybe a pitcher's like, I don't want to throw a ball. They throw a ball. Mm -hmm. So do you have a word for that, or um, what, what do you call that? So usually it's that they're, they're playing the wrong mental game. Right. Like shooting, you get to play a mental game every single time. Mm -hmm. In golf, that's why they're so similar. It's a mental game every single time. Same thing in shooting a bow. When you see the tree next to the target, all of your – your visual acuity and everything is on not hitting the tree instead yeah. of hitting the target. So it just increases the volume. It's just, it's just a problem. Problems increase the volume of thoughts. Mm -hmm. If the lay on your golf shot is close to water, your thoughts are on the water, right? But you So you need to increase the volume of your thinking, but where do you put that thinking in, your, in the golf stroke, right? That's what you got to play the right mental game. Otherwise, if you're just left to your own devices, your visual acuity is always going to drive your projectile, whatever that projectile is, toward what your thoughts are on. So the only way to override that is increase the volume of your thinking. Oh, man, I'm near the water. That's a thought. That has no instruction. It has no strategy attached to it, right? So we got to increase the volume of our thinking. Acknowledge, yes, there's water there, there's a tree there, or whatever it may be. I'm going to say this at this moment in my swing to get my conscious mind in this place. Like on a golf swing, here's a little tip for you golfers. The takeaway is closed loop. It's slow enough that you could stop it anywhere within it. That's the portion of your swing where you gain feedback. But once you send it, you got to keep your conscious mind out of it. The four swing is open loop. You got to keep your conscious mind out of it. Where do you put your conscious mind? For most sports that are not shooting, you put it in vision. That's a major tip because that's what gets, that's what judges the trajectory. That's what judges every movement that you're doing on how you hit the ball, how you shoot the ball, how you throw the ball. It's all based on vision. So at the last moment before you go open loop, you put your conscious mind in vision. Okay, but if you're looking at the water, you're gonna hit it in the water. Yeah, I would be right? visualizing success. Like, so, what do I want that ball to look like? And drawing off a previous experience. Oh, I've done this before. I've seen that shot before. So that, when you talk about visualization, you have to be careful because people talk about that a lot, especially in archery. Mm -hmm. What do they visualize in archery? I don't know what people visualize in archery. People visualize the arrow going in the X. Yes. Right, 100%. this this mystical flight of the arrow. It's very fluffy, very romantic. All this, <whistles> boop, oh, it's money. I've seen this shot a million times before. But if you visualize that, that does not bring that to fruition because you have to go through a shot process to actually make that happen. 
So I don't have people visualize their arrow going into the into the target. I have them draw their bow back at a very close range to a bale and watch them work their release. Bow and actually watch it go off right here next to your face when you're watching, you're looking at it, you're smelling it. You can, I mean, your whole consciousness is in that. Bow. You shoot that. You're like, okay, now I just saw what it feels like. You just gave your mind's eye a very clear picture of what it looks like and what it feels like to work through a trigger closed loop. We have people do this all the time, right? Just get real close to a bale, draw back, make sure you're going to hit the bale, pull your hand away from your face. Now, don't go too far because you'll lose your back tension. You pull it away, you can actually look at it. And what you'll see is the eyes don't want to look at it because an explosion oh, is going to happen. So you see this. Oh, really? Right? I'm like, no, look at it. And then you'll finally get them locked on. Okay, you got to start talking. You got to talk out loud. Yeah. So then I have them talk out loud through it. Boom. And then when they actually shoot, it's like they're having an out-of-body experience. They get to be me now. They get to be me looking at them shooting because they know exactly what it looks like hmm. to shoot a controlled shot. You've given your mind's eye that clear picture. So you don't need to visualize the arrow going in a target. That's none of your business. This is your business. So this is what you visualize. You visualize perfect execution on whatever release aid or whatever. I mean, I do that when I shoot my stick bow. If I'm shooting a tab sear, right? I'll draw it back and I'll look at it, right? Hook my thumb on the sear, bing, poof, and I actually shoot it. That's what you need to visualize. So in your golf swing, what are you visualizing? You're visualizing the ball, but that only happens if you have the angle of your club head correct and everything is right. So you visualize those certain things and not through video. Like you get have somebody else swing that's good, you get right down on the grass and you watch how the club head hits the ball, right? You get this far away from it, your eyeballs right down on the on the green, and you watch that putt, watch the speed of it, watch the the club being taken away from the ball, and then watch it strike the ball at a certain speed. That's what nobody visualizes. They visualize the ball going in the hole. That has nothing to do with you actually making that come to fruition. You got to visualize the process or even specific problems within the process. That's yeah. where visualization can be very useful. Um, to parallel that in golf, <clears throat> and we can move to another sport too, but um, the way it, we I would accomplish that is in a pre-shot routine. Mm -hmm. Hey, I have a 10-foot putt. Mm -hmm. In my pre-shot routine, I'm, I'm feeling what that feels like. Uh, I'm trying to make that putter do what I think it should do. And yeah, same thing if it was a shot that worked right to left. In my pre-shot routine, I'm trying to feel that um, with you know, things I've known developed through time and instruction now. But yeah, that would be where that comes so, in. So basically visualizing what you would normally see is a waste of time. Pretty much. Right? Pretty much, because it's not the it's none of your business. Right. Right. Once yeah. you're saying striking is, the ball correctly yeah. or shooting the arrow correctly yeah. or executing the release correctly is the problem. That's that's the process. Right? It's the process, not if the get, um it, not the get, not the, the result, net result. Right. Yeah. If you get the process right. Yeah, the ball's going in the hole. Mm -hmm. the ball's going in the in the catcher's mitt, right? But if you screw up the process somewhere, that's why the mental game is so important. That's the definition of choking, is putting your conscious mind in the wrong place at the wrong time. That's the definition of choking, especially <laughs> in professional sports. That's another good phrase. Yeah. <laughs> it really it is, is, right? Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Huh. An example of that would be basketball, sure. free, free throws, right? That's yeah. the time when people have time to play a mental game. So you ask somebody, what do you say when you shoot a free throw? And they'll almost always tell you something about the movement itself. The movement of shooting a free throw is open loop. If you talk about the movement, you'll put your conscious mind in the movement, and that kills the totality of it. So think about the game-winning free throw. When you normally would just bounce a ball three times, spin it, grab on the ball, and then shoot it. When it's the game winner, you bounce the ball three times, you spin it, you grab on the ball like, I got to make this, or I got to break my wrist yep. just right. 
follow through. That's follow through is a very common term I'm finding out in basketball. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Has nothing to do with you actually putting it in there. What's the thing? What's the governing body? The governing body of the trajectory path of that ball is your vision. It's your eyes. Yeah. So right before you shoot, you say something about your vision, like see it, rim, backboard if it's a bank shot, corner of the box, whatever. You say something that puts your conscious mind into the vision that keeps it out of the movement and allows the open loop motor program to just run. That's what needs to happen. So I, I talked to an old basketball coach. I, I trained a basketball team in this, and then I talked to an old basketball coach just to get – I like to hear how coaches do things, right? Mm -hmm. And he would put a number on the rim, and before you put power to the ball, you had to tell him what the number was. Mm. So that means that, means that your conscious mind is in the vision. But if you for, – for your listeners, I want them to watch a basketball game, and here's what they're going to see. If the eyes are to the rim after power is started on the ball, they will miss every time. If the power is given to the ball, whatever, the, whatever position the shot is, if power is given to the ball before the eyes get to the rim, it's a miss almost every time because the eyes can't calculate the trajectory. Yeah, you're taking the you're taking the depth gauge you're, away from it. You're taking the governing body. And it is physically out possible of the for it to happen, but yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you sometimes took, you took away the majority it. of it. But you watch the really good shooters; their eyes always go to the basket before powers yeah. get into the ball. Yeah, hundred percent. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I agree. But you watch in lower level sports, like I, I trained a high school girls basketball team. That was the problem. They're not looking at the rim at all. Interesting. Right? They're so worked up on the form of their shot. Their form doesn't need to be that great. They just got to get their governing body. <laughs> they got to get the the rangefinder on the doggone rim. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah, it's you not can't going put the in. cart in front of the horse, right? Right. Right. But, Simple stuff. Yeah. Master of the unknown obvious. Yeah. <laughs> God, I got to think about different stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So just whatever the problem is, plug it into the mental game equation. Where, when, and how to direct your conscious mind into a specific task at a specific moment. The how is a constant. The how is always speech. But for each one of these problems, we've got to figure out the where. That's the hardest one to figure out. Where do you put your conscious mind? The when, the moment of truth. If you understand open and closed loop control systems, you'll know the when. You'll know these moments of truth. Mm. Yeah. Is an easy way to define open and closed loop systems as conscious and subconscious? Yes, that would be. I mean, that's that's the the governing body. Just of if it, we yeah. were describing it to like yeah. you open know a mass is, group of people. Yeah, open loop is is fast and fluid, right? No yeah. feedback. Closed loop is slow enough you could stop it anywhere within it. Yeah, Con it is. It's conscious and sub. So open loop yeah. is subconsciously driven. Con uh, closed loop is consciously driven. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what are other examples of of sports that have um, closed loop systems that are really important? So the only true closed loop systems are is pretty much shooting where you are putting your conscious mind into a movement and keeping it in a movement, a very minute movement. There are aspects of golf, like a takeaway can be closed loop because that's where you're gaining feedback. It can be, yeah. Uh, um, the setup of a pitch, right? But everything before the leg lift. The pre-shot routine could be considered loop. that too. Absolutely, yeah. right? So there's portions, there's always these... There's, there's closed loop a, there's, portions. There's closed loop thing. portions, but very few are completely closed loop like shooting. Yeah. Like there's always a portion right. of most of yeah. these professional movements where you got to just send it. But if you do that in shooting, there'll be pre ignition movements yeah. linked to the trigger motor program. That's what makes shooting so different. Mm -hmm. Like I've never seen a basketball explode when somebody shot it. Right. right? right. When somebody moved it toward the basket, it doesn't explode. Mm -hmm. If it did, that would be shooting. Right then, the movement to the basket, the the shot itself, the the hand movement, the arm movement, would be anticipated, and you would have pre ignition movements like Ugh, right, right. Pre ignition movements would be yeah. linked to it. Do you remember when Shaq broke anything? the backboard? Shaq no. broke the oh, backboard yeah. in the nineties. Yeah, mm -hmm. 
But imagine if every time you went up to Donkey, you're worried about breaking the oh, backboard. Yeah. It'd be right. the same shit, right? Yeah. You'd be afraid. You'd be you'd, like, you'd, oh, God. <laughs> your, your body would naturally react because yep. you can't send a signal to this hand to say, do this, yep. and not send a signal to this hand to say, okay, react for it. Here it yeah. comes. Right. You can't trick one. Right. It doesn't work. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Your central nervous system will always override that unless yeah. you consciously override it. Right? Yeah. So shooting, yeah. Shooting, obviously, that's, you know, we're an archery podcast. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, at the basic level, how do people start to understand this in, in, in their shot? You know, like what, what's a basic test of being like, how, how do I know if I punch the trigger? Like what if they're sitting at home and they're if like, if you don't know, you probably do. If yeah. you don't know, you probably do. If but there's know, some subtleties too. Like some people punch a hinge and they don't know that they're punching it. Mm-hmm. Um, some people, it, it can be hard to, to diagnose. Yeah. So how would you know whether you're going open loop yeah. at the very end? And it would be in the reaction of the shot. Yeah. Like it would take somebody watching a video of you shooting, specifically like from the bow arm elbow back. If you had, you know, sometimes you could see it in people's bow hand, the pre-ignition movement where you yes. punch and you grab at the same time. That If you do that, then they're at the same time, they're linked, that's open loop. Yeah. So, and what I would look for, if somebody was punching a hinge, I'm not... I'm looking for this. It ends up in a closed hand like this, and it's up usually. Oh, okay. So if, if somebody breaks a shot as a surprise with any type of handheld release, boom, it almost always breaks down. Then you know, pa, and you'll see it, and just, pa, it'll break down, and, and it'll fall away. Mm-hmm. Now, out here, it's difficult to see because some people will break down and catch it. Yes. Some people will break down and fold out with it. Like, yeah. I know that Bodhi, when he goes and lets it blow out, you're not going to beat him because mm-hmm. yep. he's in his, he's in calm. He's in his He's group. in calm state. Yeah. So uh, did I already tell you the story of Bodhi at Lancaster Finals? No, but oh, it, I, if a person hasn't watched no, it, you, they're, you, they're available you did, on YouTube. but it YouTube. wasn't recorded, so yeah, yeah I would. This yeah. is a great... It's available yeah. on YouTube, and it was the greatest shoot-off I can remember. Yeah, so this is a very good example of thoughts aren't thinking Yeah. and having a toolbox. So there's, there's Bodhi shooting against top seed Mike Slosher, and Bodhi has hit every ring so far. He's smashed a bunch of 12s, and he's hitting 11s, and it's all good. So this one shot, he's going for an 11. I think it was the probably the second shot of his, I, I think it was the top target. So second shot, he draws back his bow, and he said, the aim was good. He said, okay. So he pressed the onyx clicker to the click. Everything's good. But then he noticed that his release hand was shaking. And everybody, I mean, there's a hush over the crowd. There's like, oh, my God, what's happening to Bodie Turner, right? I mean, even the <laughs> commentary. the shot that took a while to break? Yeah, the yes. commentary's okay. like, long hold. Yes, That's a long hold that. for Bodie Turner. That's yeah. a long hold. <laughs> and I'm in, the, I'm in the coach's box. I'm like, get in the toolbox, boy, yeah. right? <laughs> so there's Bodie. He notices that his hand is shaking, so what is that? That's a problem. It's an increase in the volume of thoughts. The thought of, oh, my God, my hand is shaking. Has no instruction, has yes. no strategy. It's a thought. Mm-hmm. It will not solve a problem. Clock's ticking, right? Bodhi notices he does not have enough time to let down. He's only have 30 seconds per shot. Does not have enough time to let down, so he reaches in the toolbox and pulls out the tool of the word squeeze and that's what he does he knows where that toolbox is he put that tool in there he knows exactly how to use it and when to use it so once the volume of his thoughts got past the volume of his thinking right oh my gosh my hand is shaking he's got to increase the volume of his thinking which is his voice and it's got to be the loudest one in the room so that's the word that he uses to really drive that you know, drive that concentration into that increase of pressure. So so he fought, and that's what we train for, right? We don't let down in training. He doubled down, right? Yeah, in in training, we do not let down because it's an opportunity to practice the fight. When the volume of your thoughts gets too loud, don't give up by letting down. Now, in a tournament, if you have time, by all means, please let down if you're past your optimum accuracy window. Mm -hmm. But... He didn't have that. He didn't have that time to do that, and that's the the times that we train for. You got to recognize there's a problem. The volume of your thoughts is increased. 
You got to increase the volume of your thinking. That's your voice. Reach in the toolbox and pull out the word, right? That's the mound visit. He had a mound visit with himself. Yeah. Yeah. Right? At full draw. And that's yeah. the cool thing about yeah. Shout IQ and what we do and what we, how we train people. So that um, issue with being loud enough to overcome the mm -hmm. one thought, I struggled being loud enough to overcome the mm -hmm. one thought. Do you have any... Um, any tips of something yeah. you can throw in there? Because I like I, sure. I felt like I was screaming it, and I mm -hmm. still had other thoughts come in louder mm -hmm. at times, and I was just blown awake. I mean, I felt like my vo my voice in my head was really loud, yep. and I'd still have something sneak in on me periodically. Yep. So <clears throat> it's about practicing and getting reps and getting loud in your own head. Mm -hmm. And so I had that question when I was training the Phillies. What do you mean get loud in my head? And I didn't look at the pitcher that asked me that question. I looked at the coaches. And I said, when's the last time you put him in a situation where he was forced to get loud? When's the last time when he pitched a bullpen, right, when you're just pitching just you and the catcher? When's the last time you had 10 other pitchers standing around the mound yelling at him? Yep. Right? When's the last time you gave him an opportunity to get loud in his own head? Okay. So yeah. you... You don't get to shoot that much, right? And yeah. when you do, you're probably it's about, quiet. <laughs> but you're probably about the best one there. Yeah, right. Typically. So it's people don't want to say things to you. They don't want to test you, whatever. So you have to put the pressure on yourself. So when you're like, "Hey guys, I want you all standing around me, tapping my my head with an arrow." Yeah. Right. Mess with me. Mess with you as much yeah. as you can, so that. You get reps okay. in getting loud in your own head. Okay. And comedy is one of the hardest things to overcome. Yeah. Right? <laughs> sure. Like sure. there's if you want to know Ball what busting? my vice is, yeah. Yeah. if you're around me and you make fart noises, um, it's tough. <laughs> That's tough. Right? Everything else will make me stronger, but man, me working through fart noises, that is that's my the tippy ultimate top, challenge, right? Yeah. That's my tippy top. I usually can hold together, but then it just it it overcomes me and I start laughing, right? Mm -hmm. So comedy is one of the greatest tools you could use in this getting loud in your own head, right? Because it, yeah. it will it will get to the point where like you could do whatever you want to me. I mean, like when I was with Bomar, I poured a five-gallon bucket of cold water over his head while he's at full draw. It means nothing anymore, right? It's no, it's no big deal, but you can always get somebody with comedy, right? Yeah. So that's, you know, busting balls, whatever you want to call it, man. That is a must in your shooting so that you get reps in getting loud in your own head. There you go. I did that right. a lot with Michael on the line this year. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's valuable. Almost yeah. enough. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That's cool. Good takeaways. Yeah. Um, For sure. Now, we talked about the surprise shot thing, mm -hmm. the eyes wincing. Mm -hmm. it, does that always work, or does that not not work all the time? Sometimes people don't close their eyes, but usually when they have a surprise break, you will see a micro blink a wince, right, right after. Yeah. Right? Yep. So the shot breaks, and then you'll see a tink. It'll yeah. be after. That's the only way I've been able to tell, but I didn't know if that was 100% or not. I started playing with uh, the slow-mo camera I bought forever mm -hmm. ago. Yeah. And I've I've... I've had myself filmed a couple of times. Yeah. And every time they go, Bleep. yeah. Yeah. There's a micro. Just, just sometimes a not even a full blink. Yeah. And sometimes it's like it's it, it goes down and opens back up. Yep. And I was like, oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> but, and then you'll see if they punch a trigger, it's synonymous, it's linked. Oh, so really? Yeah. The blink will be with the trigger. Oh, print. interesting. Yes. So what you're looking for is, bah, this thing breaks away and you'll yeah. see that you'll see the eyes go. Interesting. Mm. But if it's the same time, Bleep. That's when you know All it's right. a pre-ignition movement. It's linked to the trigger motor program. Yeah, yeah. Because I, yeah, that that that's a good one. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm glad to hear you elaborate on that. Yeah. Um, anything we want to add to this? Joel's a genius. <laughs> Pay for his program. <laughs> yeah. Do his stuff, man. I mean, it's just it it really is. I mean, if for for how much money they get spent on equipment and things mm -hmm. of that nature, which obviously I sell equipment. That's sure. part of my job. Sure. The first money I would spend is that. Yeah. It's gonna it's gonna help you more than any part you buy, any yeah. new bow, any new arrows, any new sight yeah, scope, cool. etc. Give that to Joel. That's my my friend just sent me that the other day. It's basically the yeah. same thing when it comes to archery, yeah, there right? You go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, this this man's program will help you more than anything you can buy. Yeah. If he's ever 
in your town, near your town, doing a seminar or doing a class, please, for the love of God, go to it. I know it might seem like a lot of money for not a, a physical product back in your hand, but it's mm-hmm. way better than any physical product you can buy or do to help yourself. I just, I can't recommend it enough. And if I could make my people go through it, I would. Like yeah, if I, I could make that. you do it before you did anything, it would save you so much grief oh, and so yeah. much effort. And you're way more likely to stay in the sport and be in the sport for a longer period of time, which is what we're trying to do. Yeah, More people in the sport, longer period of time, staying in the sport forever. He will help your, most of your problems. You yeah. really will. And it will... It'll be like a light bulb clicking on in your head. Yeah. It just really is. It just it's, saves, you know, we're on this world. We're in this on this planet for such a short amount of time. Yeah. There I mean it took me a it took me a lifetime to figure it out. It took you a lifetime to figure it out. Yeah. And it's not just knowledge anymore, it's wisdom. It is. And it, it comes from me being held 5 feet off of a target, me being in, in hostage rescues and not knowing how it was going to go. And just, you know, scaring the crap out of myself, going, man, you got to get your stuff together. And yeah. being forced to do that, and now we have the system. It's not a mystery anymore. It doesn't, your shot does not have to be a mystery. Your problems do not have to be a mystery. You know, if you're a professional player in whatever sport, it doesn't have to be a mystery on how you do what you do. Yeah. So that's what we're here for. And as hunters and archers, uh, just having the tools to deal with the high stress situation, which in hunting is the thing that we all hope for. It's mm-hmm. what you're going to experience. It's what yeah. you hope for, 100%. right? It's what yep. we all hope for. Mm-hmm. You know, that yeah. one, two, three, yeah. four times a year it might happen. It's to be able yeah. to handle that. Yep. And uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, we appreciate having you around, Joel, anytime, yeah. you know, anytime you're cruising through, we'd love to have you here. Yeah. Yeah. It. Appreciate thanks for, it, man. Thanks for spreading the word, man. Well, yeah. it's 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 necessary, man. It's the most valuable thing I can suggest to people. I yeah. appreciate it. We'll have um, Joel's socials and and um, program link down below in the description. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we'll sign off today, huh? Sweet. That's that. Thanks, guys. Yep. <laughs>